Since man first lifted off the ground, the quest for air power has been ceaseless. It is a quest fueled by relentless innovation, brave pioneering, and creative experimentation. Not without failure and tragedy, the desire for mastery of the air has carried us ever forward and ever faster. In this episode, we saw from the experimental Bell X-1 that first proved the possibility of supersonic flight to the modern jets like the F-22 Raptor that weaponized it. And from some of the largest craft ever to have taken to the sky to the miniature insect-inspired drones set to redefine the nature of combat. This is the story of air power. world's most advanced multi-role jet fighter. This is Lockheed Martin's F-35 Lightning II. With three variants, the F-35A is the conventional takeoff and landing model, built for traditional Air Force bases. The F-35B is the world's first supersonic jet capable of short takeoffs and vertical landings. Rather than having swiveling nozzles that take the flow through the engine and vector it downwards, what it does is it uses a completely separate lift fan that is positioned horizontally behind the pilot and in front of the single main engine. The F-35C specializes in operating from aircraft carriers, utilizing catapult-assisted takeoffs and barrier-arrested recoveries. All three variants of the Lightning are fast and highly maneuverable. With its array of weapon configurations changing to suit the mission, the F-35 is surprising proof that it's what's on the inside that really counts. Gaining the edge in combat, less through armament, and more through information. Information is power, and the F-35 is essentially a flying supercomputer. One of the key differences with F-35 and, and fifth generation uh, platforms is, rather than having a head-up display system, they actually project the imagery onto the helmet that you're wearing. So you're immersed in sensory information about what the aircraft's are doing at the time. An increase in situational awareness equates to an increase in pilot responsiveness. Providing an advantage that can be the difference between life or death in combat. Prior to the integration of computers and the internet with military jets, the quest for superiority in the sky came down to one crucial component, speed. The military always wants faster, and we generally want speed. If you can go faster, you can get to where you need to be quicker, or you can run away from danger quicker. Speed, for many years, was pursued as the ultimate weapon in the sky. But one barrier stood in the way, the sound barrier. This is the craft that sought to break that barrier. Nicknamed a bullet with wings, the rocket-powered Bell X-1 was in fact modelled on a Browning 50 caliber machine gun bullet, known to be stable in supersonic flight. The first proper picture of an object going faster than the speed of sound was taken in 1888 by Ernst Mach after whom the Mach number later was named. Questions loomed as to whether a plane could achieve the same speeds and whether a pilot could survive them. Hoisted into the modified bomb bay of a super fortress, the Air Force's supersonic XS-1 rocket plane is set for an assault on the sonic barrier at Muroc, California. Chuck Yeager was selected to pilot this potentially deadly experiment a role he was so determined to have 
that he kept secret the two broken ribs he'd sustained in a horse riding accident just days prior to the flight. In such pain, he was unable to seal the X-1's hatch by himself. Jaeger nonetheless took to the sky on October 14, 1947. This was a rocket-powered aircraft designed pretty much along the same lines as people had designed it in the 1940s. Straight wings, which you don't see these days anymore. Drop launched through the modified bomb bay of a B-29 Superfortress, Jaeger and the X-1, which he'd named Glorious Glennis for his wife, had only a short window before the high-powered rocket engine used up its fast-burning fuel. Captain Charles Jaeger climbs down into the cockpit of the rocket craft. The release mechanism is tripped and Uncle Sam's ace in the sky drops clear. Quickly ascending to over 13 and a half thousand meters, Jaeger chased down history, accelerating to the sound barrier breaking speed of 1,100 kilometers per hour. Because sound travels through the air in waves, if an object, such as the X-1, is fast enough, it can catch up to and overtake these waves. As the X-1 closes in on the velocity of its sound waves, these waves begin to pile up in front of it, creating a barrier of sound. The resulting change in pressure as the jet bursts through and overtakes its own sound waves is heard as a sonic boom. It simply means that if something is flying supersonically, the air will only be changed or will only realize this when this object reaches them. If it's flying subsonically, the air already knows that the object is coming even before it has reached it. Jaeger's monumental flight was kept top secret until 1948. But once the story was leaked, he became and remained one of the most famous test pilots of all time. Continuing to set speed and altitude records throughout his career, in 2012, Chuck Yeager recreated the X-1's historic flight to mark its 65th anniversary, again going supersonic at 89 years old. The success of the experimental X-1 supercharged the military's need for speed, and soon, rockets weren't the only things going supersonic. A figurative and literal black project from Lockheed's highly secretive Skunk Works division, this plane set the world record for the fastest air-breathing aircraft in 1976 and has held it ever since. The SR-71 Blackbird. Designed for stealthy reconnaissance missions over foreign countries, if the Blackbird ever found itself in trouble, the plan was to simply outrun the threat using its supersonic afterburners. An afterburner injects fuel into the engine exhaust to burn the remaining oxygen in the exhaust stream. The expansion of the gas through the nozzle accelerates the fuel out the back and Newton's law says there's an equal and opposite force that pushes the aircraft forwards. For most fighter jets, the afterburner gives added power for short bursts of three to five minutes. For the Blackbird, its engines were designed to run continuously in afterburner for hours, only slowing for mid-air refueling. But high speeds come with a cost. At full speed, it takes something like 100 nautical miles to turn around because it's aerodynamic lift or the, your ability to actually turn is so restricted at the very high speeds. The Blackbird was engineered to withstand the stresses of sustained supersonic flight, the main one being heat. For the Blackbird, surface temperatures could reach over 480 degrees Celsius. When you fly very fast, the friction between the flow over the vehicle and the structure of the vehicle produces heat through friction. And this heats the vehicle up and that challenges the structural design. Things start to distort, to fail when they get hot. Constructed largely from titanium to provide durability at high temperatures, 
In order to accommodate the metal expanding as it warmed up, gaps were left between the body panels, meaning fuel would leak when the Blackbird was on the runway. It was only when airborne and warmed by friction that the metal would expand and the gaps would seal. Gathering mission critical intelligence during the Cold War for the 25 years the Blackbird was in service, over 4,000 missiles were fired at it. Thanks to its superior speed, not a single one hit it. Speed is useful in avoiding a fight. It is also useful if you're looking to pick one. And if you throw range, maneuverability, stealth and weapons into the mix, you get a craft you do not want to mess with. You get the Lockheed F-22 Raptor. Considered the world's strongest combat aircraft, while much of the Raptor's capabilities remain classified, it's no secret that it has speed to burn. The F-22 is the first American fighter jet capable of achieving supersonic speeds without the use of fuel-guzzling afterburners. Known as supercruising, the Raptor achieves this through a highly aerodynamic design and a highly powerful set of Pratt & Whitney F-119 engines. Producing more thrust than any other fighter engine, the F-119s allow the Raptor to fly faster for longer and with less fuel. In carrying less fuel, the Raptor can carry more weapons. And by deploying these weapons while supercruising at high altitude, the Raptor provides its munitions with a helpful boost, increasing their range by about 50%. Beyond its supercruising abilities, the Raptor is also super maneuverable. Using a thrust vectoring system to direct its engine's exhaust up or down, the Raptor can pull up high-speed maneuvers that are the envy of its enemies. But it was a lack of enemies that ultimately defeated the Raptor. With a hefty price tag and a period of relative peace, the Raptor program was cancelled in 2009 with less than 200 ever produced. The military were not the only industry to see the potential of supersonic flight. And commercial airliners raced to develop a passenger plane that could match fighter jet speeds. While the Concorde may be first to mind, this is the plane that won the race, the Soviet-built Tupolev Tu-144. Codenamed Charger, the Tu-144 first flew on New Year's Eve of 1968, beating its Anglo-French rival by two months to claim honours as the first commercial supersonic plane ever flown. Jokingly labelled the Konkordsky by its European competitors, the design of the Soviet-built craft did bear a striking resemblance to that of the Concorde. Engineering problems tend to drive you to similar solutions. And so the Russian aircraft was similar in, in, in many ways. It potentially had more engineering issues, though. Both the Concorde and the Tu-144 feature distinctive hinged noses, dropping downward during takeoff and landing so that the pilots could see in front of the high-angled plane. And while both planes employed a delta wing design, never since used on commercial aircraft, the Charger had a unique added feature, its retractable forewings. With its delta wings offering limited lift at low speeds, the Charger's forewings, or mustache canard, as it was known, was used to boost the plane's lift during takeoff and improve handling during landing. While the Tu-144 was first in the air and the first commercial transport to exceed Mark II, at the Paris Air Show in 1973, disaster struck. The high-profile fatal crash delayed production of the Charger for years. 
even though it did see operation, commercial operation within the Soviet Union, it never came close to the success of the Concorde. Speed has always been the big selling point of a civil airliner. It's universally agreed that the next step should be supersonic flight. The product of a successful English-French partnership. This is the iconic craft that truly took supersonic travel to the masses. The Concorde. An amazing machine that really has yet to be surpassed in its success as one of only two supersonic transport aircraft. With its first commercial flight in 1976, the Concorde made the technological feat of supersonic travel an everyday reality. Across its quintessential route between London and New York, while a subsonic carrier might take around eight hours, the Concorde did it in three and a half. Travelling beyond the sound barrier, the Concorde was subjected to tremendous pressure. Due to the intense heat of such high speeds, the Concorde's frame was designed to allow expansion of over 25 centimetres. The key to unlocking supersonic flight for a plane as big as the Concorde was here. The distinctive delta-shaped wings, though they came with a compromise. Only generating limited lift when flying at low speeds, for the Concorde to get off the ground, a high-speed takeoff was necessary. And even more nerve-wrackingly high-speed landings were required in order to control descent. But once the plane got up to speed in the air, the Delta wings were more than worth it. When a plane breaks the sound barrier, the shockwave boundary folds back toward the plane. With a conventional wing design, the shockwave would strike the plane at the wings, creating drag. The Delta Wing's thin, streamlined profile avoids the shockwave entirely, enabling efficient and stable supersonic travel. There are not many aircraft, really, that come anywhere close to the Concorde and be able to sustain such high speeds for such long periods of time. And so that comes down to this idea of an aeropropulsive balance that the faster you fly, the more drag you produce. And so you need very, very good aerodynamic design to minimise that drag. But then to overcome that drag, you need very efficient engines. So you need the combination of powerful, efficient engines with very efficient aerodynamic design. So we see that in the Concorde. In service for 27 years, the Concorde made just under 50,000 flights in its lifetime allowing some two and a half million people to experience flight beyond the speed of sound. There was controversy in the form of noise complaints from the sonic booms it generated, but ultimately it was economics that led to the Concorde's retirement in 2003, with the supersonic plane not profitable against the carrying capacity of its larger, slower rivals. There is a lot of work currently underway through various engineering companies around the world designing what will follow the Concorde. What we are likely to see in the pretty near future is the emergence of operational supersonic business jets. Incorporating advances in aerodynamics and jet engines with lighter, cheaper composite materials, startup company Boom Technology aims to have a fleet of mini Concords by 2023. Set to fly faster and more efficiently than their iconic predecessor, Boom proposes ticket prices on par with traditional carriers, making supersonic flight more accessible than ever before. Ever since Chuck Yeager first piloted the Bell X-1 to supersonic speeds, experimental aviation has been faced with a question. How to get from supersonic to hypersonic? Hypersonic is going much faster than the speed of sound. 
So there's a barrier at the speed of sound where you start to form shock waves. And supersonic is faster than that, and hypersonic is more than five times faster than the speed of sound. Today, this is the cutting edge of hypersonic flight, NASA's X-43A. The X-43 is a supersonic combustion ramjet engine or a scramjet engine. And that's an engine that's designed to burn fuel faster than the speed of sound. A single-use unmanned craft, the X-43A broke its own previous record of Mark 7 on November 16, 2004, when it reached a staggering speed of approximately 10,600 kilometres per hour, close to 10 times the speed of sound. To reach such speeds, the X-43 is first carried into the air by a customised B-52 Stratofortress. When it is drop launched, the X-43 is attached to a Pegasus rocket booster which fires up to carry the craft even higher and faster. Launch. Sequence and reset. Ignition. Ignition. After levelling out at an altitude of over 30,000 metres and already flying at five times the speed of sound, the X-43 switches to its own scramjet engine and leaves the rocket behind. Separation. Fuel is on. Unlike a turbojet that compresses air with a rotating compressor, a scramjet uses forward velocity and aerodynamics to achieve the same effect without moving parts. In the X-43, the craft itself is integrated with the engine, with the front designed to scoop up oxygen, forcefully compressing the supersonic airflow before combusting it with hydrogen fuel. The expanding hot gases are expelled through the aft of the plane, which acts as a nozzle to accelerate the exhaust, generating its tremendous thrust. Normally, if you want to go really fast, like you want to go into space or something, then you would use a rocket. But a rocket has to bring its oxygen with it. If you have an engine that can use the oxygen in the air, then you don't have to bring it with you and you can carry more payload. Generating tremendous thrust without the need for onboard oxygen, the X-43 is proving scramjet technology. I think we'll see scramjets with military purposes, so perhaps for fighter aircraft, certainly for missiles and potentially for access to space. While the power of speed remains prized in the air, size can also be an asset or a liability. The longest flying machine and largest by volume, the LZ-129 Hindenburg launched to great fanfare in Germany on March 1936. The Hindenburg, Germany's latest and greatest dirigible, rises from Friedrichshafen on her first demonstration flight. It was massive, it was 245 metres long. That's three and a half times the length of a Boeing 747. It was huge. Powered by four reversible Daimler-Benz diesel engines, the Hindenburg gracefully made 17 round trips across the Atlantic. Complete success crowns the Hindenburg's first South Atlantic crossing and the biggest airship ever built land safely at Rio de Janeiro. Heralded as the future of air travel, today it is remembered as one of the world's biggest air disasters. It had a fatal flaw in that it was filled with hydrogen rather than an inert gas like helium, which is what you would use today. Nearing the fatal end of her first Atlantic trip of the season, the Hindenburg approaches the mooring mast at Lakehurst. Scarcely 100 feet above ground, the giant airship with her framework encasing 7 million cubic feet of inflammable gas is being carefully manoeuvred towards her hangar, when suddenly... 
May 6th, 1937, the Hindenburg explodes into flames while docking in New Jersey. With a simple spark of static electricity, 36 people lost their lives, marking the end of the airship era. But the quest for scaled up air transport continued. And during the Second World War, the need to fly troops and material across the Atlantic resulted in the largest aeroplane ever constructed, the Hughes H-4 Hercules. Built by the larger-than-life businessman and aviator Howard Hughes, the construction of this flying cargo ship was made more challenging by US wartime restrictions on metals, resulting in it being built entirely from wood. It was intended to be a flying ship, and it was designed at a time when conventional shipping across the Atlantic was being sunk in very high numbers by German U-boats. Howard Hughes flying boat has a wing spread of 320 feet, and that gives you some idea of its size. Howard Hughes himself checked the controls before the first tests were carried out at Long Beach, California. Powered by eight Pratt & Whitney Wasp Major engines, the largest aviation piston engines ever mass-produced in the US, the craft made just one flight in 1947. The unannounced decision was made during a taxi test, and with Hughes himself at the controls, the airboat reached an altitude of around 20 metres for a single minute. The aircraft remained in ground effect during that whole flight, which meant it was still being supported by the effect of the wings on the ground or the water underneath. So we don't know whether it would ever have flown like a, you know, a conventional aircraft, but it flew. We did it. That was how it used. That's the way he operated. The Second World War drove demand not only for large-scale transport, but for heavy bombers. One of the largest operational aircraft during the war, the B-29 Superfortress was also the most expensive US weapons project of its time, outspending the Manhattan Project that developed the first nuclear bomb by more than a billion dollars. The B-29 Superfortress is highly advanced for its time. It had things like tricycle undercarriage, which was unusual in those days. It had pressurisation of the cabin, which was most unusual in those days. Remotely controlled defensive guns. It was a bit of a technical marvel. At the end of the day, it was the aircraft that ended the Second World War. At 2.45 in the morning, August 6, 1945, Colonel Tibbetts takes the Enola Gay down the runway into the air. Flying under four right duplex cyclones, the most powerful radial engines ever made in the US, the B-29 cruised at high altitudes beyond the range of ground defences. The heaviest production plane of its day, the B-29's ultimate power was in the nuclear weapons it was equipped to carry. And, in the final stages of the war, this ultimate power was used, with two separate B-29s dropping two separate nuclear bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At 9.15, the bomb is dropped. The aircraft banks away at high speed. Killing an estimated 129,000 people, these controversial and devastating bombings forced the surrender of Japan and remained the only use of nuclear weapons in warfare.
another Boeing giant designed to carry nuclear armaments, the B-52 Stratofortress is a Cold War relic that refuses to die. First flown in 1952, the Strato Fortress was built as a high altitude nuclear bomber. Designed to fly above the range of ground based defense systems and deliver its nuclear payload anywhere in the world. As the Cold War hotted up, the B 52s became the only bomber that mattered. With Operation Chrome Dome ordering nuclear equipped B 52s to fly the Soviet Union's borders 24 hours a day for eight years running. The B 52's main role is a strategic bomber. Its capability has developed over the years from one of dropping just unguided dumb bombs. It's now able to carry and deploy a full range of guided weapons. Scheduled to remain in service until at least 2040, the B-52 Stratofortress will be flown by the great-grandchildren of its original pilots, proving this huge craft's unparalleled power in terms of sheer longevity. Powered by the rising property of heated air, or by harnessing gases less dense than air. Throughout the long history of ballooning, the technology has remained simple, while the achievements have become increasingly impressive. In 1906, the world's first international air race, the Gordon Bennett Cup, was established for balloons, a race that continues to this day. Paris was the starting place of the recent balloon race, Yes, balloon racing has begun again, in spite of all the more recent inventions and advances in aviation. First reaching the stratosphere in 1932, balloons continue to take us higher, with new benchmarks constantly being set. And balloons, the first form of air power, continue as a significant force today, carrying us ever further. High-flying and efficient, balloons have been incorporated into NASA's space research program where they have proven to have a range of advantages over rockets. High-altitude space balloons are a way where you can do space-like environments cheaply, uh, more efficiently, and they often end up being a test bed for bigger experiments that eventually do go into space. Comprised of a thin film of polythylene, about the thickness of a sandwich wrap, building a balloon is hardly rocket science. And it's a lot cheaper. With a balloon launch attracting far less red tape than a typical rocket launch, this old school technology is once again at the cutting edge. I think the biggest thing that I'm impressed by is that they fly. <laughs> they look so flimsy. I mean, the material is, it's like cellophane. You would think that, how could this thing survive the harsh environments of going all the way up 30, 40, 50, 60 kilometers, staying for that long, and then just gently land on the ground? Capable of lifting over three and a half thousand kilograms, NASA's balloon program uses two different types of helium-filled balloons to transport scientific payloads into the atmosphere. So we have what we call zero pressure balloons. So these are really enclosed balloons, but because the higher you get into the sky, there's lower pressure, so gas expands. But by going really high, air eventually escapes and eventually seep out and you come straight back down. Super pressure balloons, on the other hand, are completely sealed holding a relatively constant gas pressure in the face of changing temperatures. It acts like a bladder, so it's like a balloon inside a balloon. You have hydrogen in one shell, helium in the other, and you expand and contract that inner bladder, and that allows you to keep in a stable altitude, in a stable orbit, or a stable position of the Earth. 
And these can go for hundreds of days or even months. The scale of these scientific balloons is truly enormous. With a size well over one million cubic meters, a fully inflated balloon can easily contain a sporting stadium. The quest for new sources of power in the sky is unending. With its array of photovoltaic cells and battery storage units, the Swiss-engineered solar impulse is powered purely by the sun. And it is already breaking records. Among them, the first circumnavigation of the world by a piloted solar aircraft. The aim now is to repeat the feat without stopping. Quieter, cleaner and more efficient, this flying solar panel has greater ambitions than just breaking records. Seeking to move flight beyond limited fossil fuels to a source of endless renewable energy. In certain areas, the power of the pilot is every bit as important as the power of the plane. Almost as old as flight itself, aerobatics and air racing today is codified into a popular spectator sport. Stunts such as these test not only a plane's manoeuvrability, but a pilot's nerve and skill. A successful aerobatic pilot needs to manage the g-forces that their bodies are subjected to, as well as the physical stress on the body of the plane. The stunt plane of the military world. The Mikoyan MiG-29 is capable of aerial feats that would be impossible with regular aerodynamic controls. Designed as a multi-role fighter capable of operating from improvised airfields at the front lines of the Cold War, the MiG-29 first took to the sky in the late 70s. Codenamed Fulcrum, this was one of the last cutting-edge jet fighters produced before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it continues to serve in the Russian Air Force today. With twin Klimov RD-33 turbofan engines spaced widely apart to provide additional lift, the lightweight Fulcrum boasted excellent acceleration with a top speed exceeding Mark II, faster than its American F-16 rival. But the MiG-29's real claim to fame is its super maneuverability. Proven by the demanding move known as Pugachev's Cobra, this is a rapid pitch-up manoeuvre, so the aircraft is flying along, pitches its nose up even beyond the vertical, and then can recover that back down and resume normal flight, which for a, a conventional aircraft is just impossible. The aircraft would stall and, and, and lose um, altitude very rapidly. The fulcrum's wing shape generates a vortex of air over the front edge. That vortex is generating quite a bit of force. It's maintaining the lift at an angle of attack of the aircraft well beyond where a normal aircraft would stall. For all its agility, the MiG-29 was undermined by some notable shortcomings. A lack of modern electronics meant that its pilots had limited situational awareness. And with a range of less than 1,500 kilometres, and no in-flight refuelling ability, the Fulcrum was a multi-role fighter in name only, primarily serving in defence or frontline support. Despite these limitations, with a reasonable price tag and recent upgrades to address some of its shortcomings, this Soviet-era jet continues to serve in militaries around the world. As jet fighters engaged in increasingly risky manoeuvres at increasingly high altitudes, the question of how pilots could safely bail out came to the fore. This 
is how it was answered. Riding a high altitude balloon into the stratosphere, Colonel Joseph Kittinger performed a series of experiments throughout the late 50s and early 60s as part of the US Air Force's project to develop safe ejection equipment for high altitude pilots. Kittinger's job was to jump. Wearing a pressurized suit to prevent his blood from boiling at the extreme heights, in 1959, Kittinger stepped out from the balloon's gondola to perform the world's first stratospheric space dive. It was a first, and nearly a last for Kittinger, as an equipment malfunction caused him to black out, with his automatic parachute saving his life. Our bodies are built to be on the Earth with gravity and relatively normal temperatures not to go through in extremes and in extremes in only a few minutes. So you're really pushing your body to the limit when they do these jumps. Indomitable, Kittinger returned to the stratosphere twice more. And it was during the ascent for his final jump in 1960 that the seal on his right glove failed. Kittinger kept quiet as his hands swelled to twice the normal size and lost function. These stratosphere jumps have a huge team of medical doctors monitoring every part of it, because when they land, they need to know how to treat them. Are they deprived of oxygen? Have they had hypothermia? Are there pressure problems? Can they see? Are they gonna have a heart attack? Kittinger persevered, ascending to a manned balloon altitude record of 31 kilometers before again taking the plunge. I had made the jump a thousand times in my mind, so when it came time to go, I was ready to go. I reached 614 miles an hour. I free fell for four minutes and 36 seconds. And then once the parachute was open, it took about 10 minutes to get to the ground. And when I landed, my team was there, and we were uh, happy campers. Man is capable of remarkable feats in the air. But today, a new trend in aviation is seeing the pilot taken out of the plane. Today, we are witnessing the rise of the drones. Pilots get tired, they need to be fed, they need to go to the toilet, whereas a robot machine can just keep flying. As long as there's power and there's fuel, it can just keep going and going and going. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs for short, have been in the sky in various forms since 1916. With advances in technology, these flying robots are now a genuine power in the sky and are only becoming more powerful. With a range of sizes and capabilities, drones are used in everything from agriculture to racing. It is the military that has produced the greatest leaps in drone technology. And this is the result. General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper. The first unmanned hunter-killer designed for long endurance missions and high altitude surveillance. The Reaper is powered by a 900 horsepower turboprop engine. That enables it to fly for 14 hours at heights up to 50,000 feet. More powerful than previous models, the Reaper can not only fly further, but can carry a heavier payload. With a wealth of advanced sensors in its bulbous nose, and weapons including laser-guided bombs and Hellfire missiles, the Reaper is the world's deadliest drone. Connected by a satellite link, the Reaper is always monitored by a pilot, analysing the images the craft provides and issuing commands from the safety of a ground control station thousands of kilometres from the conflict.
progress continues with Northrop Grumman's X-47B. The first strike fighter sized drones to achieve carrier based launches and recoveries. It has a unique capability that it can be launched and recovered to a ship at sea, which means the force and the power of that vehicle can be projected to anywhere in the world. The X-47B has also demonstrated the first autonomous aerial refueling of an unmanned aircraft, setting the stage for entire fleets of carrier-based UAVs. new generation of military drones are already taking to the sky. And with the pilots staying grounded, the machines have gotten small. We're going to see drones that are smaller, and we're going to see drones that are smarter. Instead of people, these micro drones can carry communications payloads such as cameras, able to penetrate spaces inaccessible to conventional UAVs. They offer applications ranging from counterinsurgency to search and rescue. Or they can be weaponized. Released from Air Force bombers, clusters of explosive drones are set to replace the cluster bomb. Staying aloft to perform aerial manoeuvres, they adopt a holding pattern before diving down at the right moment and self-detonating with enhanced precision. The new aerial arms race is smart and small, and within a generation, the nature of conflict could be rendered almost unrecognisable. But going small poses a big problem. At this level, everything we know about powered flight ceases to work, and a new understanding of fluid dynamics is required. An understanding provided by nature. Essentially, the smaller you go, the more resistance air provides. And on the insect scale, the air is a thicker, stickier medium. Moving through air at this level is more like swimming than flying. And this is where fluid dynamics comes in. When an insect flaps its wings, a swirling vortex of air is formed, creating an area of high pressure to push the wing up from below. Before flapping down again, the wing rotates to create a backspin force, pulling a faster stream of air over its top surface. As the wing hits the vortex from its previous stroke, it generates additional force that can be directed up or down by the angle of the wing, a principle called wake capture. While humans are yet to manufacture a machine that perfectly mimics insect flight, the power of wake capture is being used to create a range of insect-inspired machines. Nature as inspiration is particularly useful for these really small scales of flight because it, it provides a way to, to overcome this, this scaling problem and say we can more efficiently generate flight at these small scales. While nature has had millions of years to perfect animal flight, humans have just had a few hundred. In returning our focus to the natural world, our understanding of flight and the unique properties of air is being revolutionised. And the skies are set to become a very different place.